Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast brought to you by Letterman Row and our good friends at Byers Auto. I am Jeremy Birmingham. That is Spencer Holbrook. Um, again, we're just talking Ohio State football recruiting in a time when there's not a lot of Ohio State football recruiting happening. And Spencer um, is wearing a hat because he hasn't had a haircut in two months. Uh, I probably should be doing the same. But, you know, I think it's just uh, symbolic, I guess, Spencer, of how messy kind of everything is right now, right? Like, who the hell knows what's happening? Um, and I guess this is where I'm glad I cover recruiting for the site as opposed to daily football stuff because at least there is still – we're still projecting, you know what I mean? Like, it's not about yeah. what's going on today. It's about what's happening in the future. And, um, you know, for us to talk about Ohio State football recruiting, I do want to get into the some – you know, scuttlebutt stuff that's going on right now, especially around Chumiche Adelaide. But other than that, we're, we're kind of just in this holding pattern where the Buckeyes are evaluating kids at a slower pace than they are than they would like because they can't go out and see them. Kids aren't making visits, so you don't have a lot, whole lot of news. So really right now it's like when, when one kid gets an offer or um, uh, drops a, an updated list. I mean, I think you're seeing a lot of kids – right now decide to them for themselves like hey maybe i need to speed this up because who knows what's going to happen and i i think that's probably why you saw if you're paying attention to the crystal ball world um uh some movement on the tumiche adelaide side of things on tuesday night there appears to be some communication that he's informed other colleges that he's made as a decision but that doesn't necessarily mean that a decision is imminent. I think it just, it, he's always said he wanted to make his announcement in August. And I don't know that that's changing, but it does seem that there is some uh, smoke percolating that maybe you could see a commitment from Adelaide in the near future. Um, and the people that I've talked to on, on the Ohio state side of things and other school sides of things seem to think that's going to turn in the Buckeyes favor, despite uh, a lot of momentum for Florida in the last month and a half or so. So keep an eye on that. That could be coming. Interesting enough. Uh, that's one that we kind of didn't expect during the quarantine, right? That defensive line recruiting, we've already talked about it. It's, it's a pretty slow, methodical approach from Larry Johnson. If he gets a, a four borderline five-star commitment, is he a five-star now? No, he's, he, he dropped down to four. He's like the 43rd ranked player in the country, according to the 247 oh, sports composite. But he is a guy that was a five-star up until this last rankings uh, re-rank. And I, I don't know if that's because uh, the people that had a chance to see him in, in the early um, opening camps and rivals camps are starting to understand or appreciate what we've suggested all along is that I don't know that there's a true position out there right now for Adelaide because he insists that he's a defensive end. Some analysts see him as a three-tech from talking to people around the Buckeyes program, they seem to think that he can play the end position. I look at him and I see a Jay Sean Cornell type body and, and talent, um, which is pretty good. I mean, Jay Sean was the number one ranked player in the country for ESPN in their ESPN 300 for almost a full year um, back in the class of 2015. So it's a lot of upside. I don't know if he's quite as athletic as Cornell was coming out of, out of uh, Minnesota when he did, but, that's sort of the comparison I see, but I just don't know that people are able to put him in an actual position, and I think that's affected his ranking. Berm, do you think – well, first I want to clarify. There are 32 every year five-star recruits in 24-7 sports' rankings, not the composite, but for their rankings, there are 32 of them. So, I mean, he's about nearly as close as you can get if he's the 43rd-ranked player. You know, he's only a couple spots. Yeah, I think J.K. Dobbins was the 43rd-ranked player. He turned out a kid. Yeah, and, and the other thing is – like I was saying, Larry Johnson's so methodical in what he does and how he approaches recruiting. If the Buckeyes can, you know, land a, land a commit from one of these guys, one of these defensive linemen in the class, let alone a, a borderline five-star prospect in this class, uh, while there's almost a dead period going on, uh, you have to think that there's another trick up the sleeve once these guys can get back on campus. Yeah, I think it's really – I mean, if this happens anytime soon, I'm not suggesting it's absolutely going to, but I think it could. I think it, what it does for Ohio State – is help them uh, in their efforts to add JT to Amalo or maybe go back and continue fighting for Damian Robinson, someone like that. When you're talking about, if you now have Jack Sawyer 
and Michael Hall and Adelaide combined, if, if that happens anytime soon, you have a, a pretty good trio um, to approach other players with and say, hey, you're the final piece, you're the missing piece or two of this class. Um, get on board and, and help us build something. So um, sure. as far as – go ahead. Uh, I know everybody likes to look at Ohio State comparisons, and you already mentioned Jashan Cornell. Do you think Adelaide is a little – not slower, I don't think is the right word, but I guess for lack of a better term, a slower, like a Draymond Jones type in that three-tech role? Because he was I mean, more – he was a good pass rusher from the three-tech, and I think he probably could have played defensive end if they needed him there. Do you think that is like a comparison? I, I don't think that at this point Adelaide has the explosiveness that a guy like Draymond Jones had. Draymond was an exceptional basketball player and a very good get off on the line of scrimmage. And right now, Adelaide's best parts of his game are the way he uses his hands. He's very physical, but not quite as explosive uh, athletically as Cornell was coming out of high school or uh, Draymond Jones or Adolphus Washington, that type. And that's, that's the projection. I think when you're looking at a guy six foot three, 260, 270 pounds, that's the projection. I mean, unless he's going to end up putting on another 30 pounds by the time he gets to college and end up purely as an inside guy at, at 290, 295, um, then he, he takes on a different form. But uh, right now, it's, it's just about what his body does. And I don't think that when you look at most of these young guys, they haven't had the, the physical training to really maximize their, their frame. Um, in Adelaide, coming from two years at, at Katie Tompkins High School in Texas, getting ready to play a senior year at the IMG Academy. You just don't know exactly how much training he's been given. Um, uh, obviously, he's very productive. He's a two-time All-District player as a sophomore and as a junior in, in Katie, Texas. Um, you know, highly competitive area. But um, what you might see on tape is that he doesn't always have like a motor, I guess. But when you've seen him and when I've seen him in film of camps and stuff like that, he seems to kind of flip a switch and get to a higher gear when he's playing against a higher competition. So I think similar to Jacoby Cowan in that way, if uh, we're talking about another recent defensive end slash defensive tackle possibility, it's again, not quite as athletic as Cowan who, who's a, you know, when you look at Jacoby Cowan run, he looks like he could be a sprinter, even though he's not, you know, he's not a 4-4 guy, but 4-8, four, 4-9, four, uh, and just the, the stride and that stuff. So I'm, just, I'm interested to see how Adelaide grows from a physical standpoint um, heading into his senior year and utilizing what IMG can offer uh, players from a developmental standpoint. But, again, all that could be moved. I'm just saying right now the talk is that there is potentially been decisions and discussions made with Adelaide and other schools that if he has told them that he is not going there, uh, that is not set in stone. It's not saying that a decision is coming soon, but it's certainly worth talking about. And that's why we started this episode of talking stuff uh, on that topic. And that's really it. I mean, everything else right now that's out there is sort of just fluff. Um, and so Spencer and I are going to continue to do what we've done in the last few episodes, the last three weeks, and just answer a few questions from readers. Um, again, we collected those on Twitter. If you're not on Twitter, you can email them to Spencer at Letterman Row or uh, uh, Berm at Letterman Row, and we can try to answer them uh, on the show in that way. But the best way is to follow at Spencer Holbrook or at Berm on Twitter um, so that we can really get questions there and so people can have a chance to win some swag additional swag delicious stuff spencer what do we got what do people want to know today well first i'm going to start off with a question i didn't write down so i don't know who it's from but i know people have been asking it and i don't know if we've really covered it as much as we probably should have so we had a reader ask what is the likelihood that these virtual visits continue beyond uh this quarantine because if you have a kid from california who maybe can't make a trip but you can provide a virtual visit and you know those have worked because you're getting commitments based on them in the last couple of weeks or last couple of months. Do you yeah. think those could continue to stick and maybe do virtual visits starting after the quarantine with kids from far away who might not be able to visit? I mean, it seems like a natural progression of things. It, it obviously is effective. Uh, it's not quite as effective as in-person recruiting and 
having people get a feel for the city of Columbus and, and what campus really is like the scope of Ohio State because it is such a huge place. Uh, and I don't know if maybe that element of it uh, is properly expressed in the virtual visits. But when you're talking about giving kids an opportunity to just talk to Ryan Day, to talk to Ryan Stamper, to talk to Mick Marotti, to talk to uh, academic advisors, to talk to financial aid, to talk to professors and that kind of stuff, this is certainly a very unique um, setup and probably is something that will get continued to be used in the future. But it's still not going to remove what is the preference, and that's to get people, kids and their families on campus. Because the first thing that a kid from California, for example, let's, let's just pick random kid A from California. The first thing that coming to campus does for Ohio State is show the Buckeyes that this player is actually invested in an opportunity with Ohio State. And, and I know that sounds crazy, but if a kid and his family are willing to spend a thousand plus dollars on the flights and, and hotels and to come visit the school, you certainly can feel confident that that player and that family are more serious about Ohio State than a kid who's willing to spend 30 minutes on a Zoom call. Yeah. You know, so so I guess that's the ultimate difference is that you 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 get a higher return on investment when it comes to kids coming in to visit because that is a surefire sign that they're very actually interested in the school if they're making unofficial visits on their own dime. All right, so, so we, we got so that was a reader question, but also my question because I've been wondering sure, sure, sure. while I'm sitting in quarantine. Um, but this is a really good question. I really like this question. And Ryan P. I don't know his last name. It's just Ryan P. Um, he asks, do you view the departure of Kenny Ananuki as having an impact on 2021 defensive line recruiting, such as Adelaide, JT Tuimalo? I'm going to get that name right eventually. Um, Tuimalo. Tuimalo. Okay, there we go. Um, I got Adelaide's right. Now I just got yeah, it. You're, you're, you're working. You're working. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that the, the departure of Kenny Ananuki to – to Fordham, you know, he's a New York guy wanting to go home and uh, get an opportunity to be a, a, a actual assistant coach, which is a huge step for anyone who comes from uh, an assistant position coach to, to get to run your own room. It's, it's a step that's necessary for Kenny to take if he ever wants to get back to Ohio State. If he wants to be the guy when Larry Johnson retires, um, it's something he had to do. And maybe people see it as a step down because it's just to Fordham and not like another Big Ten school or something like that. But the goal here is to get him the experience about running his own room. It didn't matter where it was, really. Um, do I think it impacts Ohio State's recruiting? Not really. Uh, Larry Johnson is obviously a legend in the, in the position coach world and at the defensive line position especially. He's still really the guy in charge of the majority of evaluation, watching on tape, getting to know these kids, getting to know their families, and in UK, and the other assistants are, are there to help provide some context and to watch video and to bring guys to his attention. I think the biggest area it actually could impact Ohio State is on the field in 2021 or 2020 because of the fact that he's a really good coach. I mean, he's been coached by Larry Johnson for a few years and working with Larry Johnson. So, you know, if you lose that opportunity to have basically a, a Larry Johnson junior, junior, um, on the field with him, I think that's where you see the impact the most um, because now Larry has to find another guy that he trusts and is comfortable with to teach his system and to teach his players. But does that impact 2021 recruiting or beyond? I don't think so. All right. There's your answer, Ryan P. Uh, Andy asks, how big of a threat is Michigan to our targets? Ohio, obviously our meaning Ohio State. Uh, I read these verbatim. Do you think they will finish strong? if they get Donovan Edwards, Damon Payne, Rocco Spindler, and David Davidkoff. That's a big if, though, because those are four guys that are all considering a variety of schools. And uh, we've already seen, and it's been proven time and time again, that just because you're from the state of Michigan does not mean you have an allegiance to Michigan. Yeah, I mean, you look at Rocco Spindler, that seems to be a, a Michigan and Notre Dame battle, Ohio State, a few other schools still in the mix. Garrett Dellinger, uh, Damon Payne, I, I, I don't think there's any, any chance he's going to Michigan. It just doesn't seem – at all like it's uh, going to happen. Donovan Edwards, obviously, is a player Ohio State really liked, and I think he will end up at Michigan if, if he doesn't pick Georgia or LSU or Oklahoma or somewhere like that. But, um, you know, right now, I guess the question is, are those players really Ohio State targets? 
and that's the nuance of recruiting. Clearly, Donovan Edwards was an Ohio State target, but with Evan Pryor and Travion Henderson committed, he's not really anymore. So um, is Michigan a threat to Ohio State targets? I mean, David Davikoff is a guy the Buckeyes like, but he's been on campus once. That's not a relationship that they're pushing for a commitment. They're still looking more at guys like Jagger Burton and, and Tristan Lee and other players like that on the offensive line, J.C. Latham. Um, so – Who's the real target, I guess? I mean, that's the question. Yeah. So, Michigan is going to end up with a top 10 recruiting class. I, they, they, they could stumble into a top 10 recruiting class every single year. If, I mean, 10 or 11, 12, whatever, that, that upper group. But the gap between the fourth-ranked class and the eighth-ranked class is way larger than the gap between the eighth-ranked class and the 19th or 20th-ranked class. So, um Right now, there is a upper tier of the recruiting programs. That's Ohio State, Clemson, Georgia, Alabama, Oklahoma. And then there's everyone else. LSU, I mean, yeah, they're, they're working their way into that conversation. Michigan is not a threat to that group right now. I mean, there's going to be players that they win battles over LSU, Georgia, because, because it is from Michigan. But – you know, Michigan right now is in that second tier, and, and that's where they're going to be as a recruiting program until they start winning big games. I just don't think you're going to see a change. Uh, can I just add that I would not – and I've never – I've not heard anything. I do not have sources on the matter. I just wouldn't be surprised if Michigan State crawls into the Donovan Edwards uh, conversation because I think Mel Tucker, uh, for whatever you want to say about him at Colorado, is going to recruit his tail off at Michigan State. And I think Mel Tucker is dynamic and he's done a good job putting together a good staff. Um, you know, Michigan State just offered Miles Rouser, who's a 2022 commit for Michigan, who's now down at IMG. Like, I mean, they're going to try. I mean, they offered a Michigan commit because they want to try to flip him. So, I mean, we'll see how that plays out. But again, all those things, I mean, the reason that Michigan State overtook Michigan as the uh, the go-to school in the state of Michigan in the last decade or prior to Jim Harbaugh's arrival was because Michigan state was beating them on the field. So it, it, a lot of this is cyclical, but you're going to have to win games on the field and for Michigan to really be a threat to Ohio state. Like if Ohio state and Michigan are going mano a mano for a recruit from Indiana or from Pennsylvania or anywhere around the country. So take away the natural bias of a kid being from Ohio or from Michigan. Generally speaking, the Buckeyes are going to win that battle because they are just a superior program right now. And, and one of the examples is, and I can't even give the recruit's name because I can't remember, but I read a, a story from a different publication that said uh, the Wolverines have a good chance of landing this four-star prospect. Uh, he was on campus for the Ohio State game. Well, what did he see at the Ohio State game? So it's like you're not going to win a lot of battles against Ohio State when what continues to happen on the field just continues to happen. So, well, I mean, you just have to look at it from this, the Michigan's top recruits in, in the class of 2021, J.J. McCarthy, Greg Cripp, and all these guys. These guys are one – if Donovan Edwards ends up – these are guys who probably would have picked Ohio State uh, if they were able to. And they just, for whatever reason, a number of different things happened and they didn't and couldn't. So um, I just think it, if we're being objective, it, it's not a knock on Michigan. They're still one of the top ten programs in the country. I, I think, think they do that, a fantastic job of recruiting. I think they really yeah, do. I think people <laughs> need to understand that they're still a top 10 program in the country. Um, but the gap between the top five or top six down to, to 10 is, is pretty large when you're talking about um, development, on-field talent, uh, results. I mean, those things are, are what matters. And um, kids see that. And it's not a knock on what Jim Harbaugh is doing. They're a top 10 program and have continued to be and will continue to be. But – that gap is pretty large. So are they a threat to Ohio State um, when it comes to true Ohio State targets? Right now, I don't think so. And that's, that, that changes when, when they start winning games on the field against the Buckeyes. It's always healthy to have a little Ohio State-Michigan talk in the middle of April. Sure. Hey, I, I love talking about the rivalry in all aspects. And I, I think that the worst that, and again, you and Austin always brag on me about it, but like, you can't ignore this, the history of this rivalry, and, and it, it will change. It will change again at some point. It will equal out. I mean, 
when that happens, I don't know how it happens, but um, it's going to happen. So you have to keep an eye on that side of, of the rivalry. If you're being true to yourself as a paranoid, you know, Ohioan. Well, it was supposed to happen in 2011, and then it was also supposed to happen in 2015, and it didn't. So I'm not sure how that happens, but but you might. Well, be right. there was no way it should have happened in 2011. Let's be frank. Okay, I mean, if Luke when Fickle Tatgate came in, out, when Tatgate came out, Ohio State fans were going insane. Sure. And so I know what I'm saying, but if that hadn't happened, there's there's not a reasonable expectation that the 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 dynamic would have shifted if Jim Trussell was still there in 2011 and Brady Hoke came in. It was, it's not like, you know, th- there's been noticeable or, or moments you can pinpoint, I guess, over the last 20 years where you're like, okay, this should be a, a, a changing moment. 2011 should have been a changing moment. And then Ohio State hired Urban Meyer, right? And it wasn't. 2019 should have been a changing moment when Urban Meyer left and Jim Harbaugh had one of his best teams um, and Ryan Day took over and the Buckeyes still scored 60 points. So like you just, if those things don't change it, you and what's going to change it is Michigan getting better players um, and acknowledging that they have to adjust their approach. And I don't know that they will, but anyway, move on. Uh, Next. Uh, Garrett asks, is Ohio State. Garrett Wilson. Yeah, it's Garrett. It's actually Garrett Wilson. Oh. Nice. He's a huge listener of the show. Garrett, if you're listening, hello. Hello, Uh, Garrett Wilson. (laughs) Uh, Garrett asks, is Ohio State actually gaining steam in the Ray John Davis recruitment, or is it just false hope considering he's already pledged to LSU? And I want to preface this with, if you're an Ohio State fan, respond to this on Twitter or YouTube or something, and tell me why every year Ohio State fans find one LSU commit, and they're just like, oh, Ohio State's getting him. No, you know, that, that's, a, that's a guy that Ohio State has to get. Like, why is it always LSU? I just want to know. Like, I'm just curious. So, go ahead. Well, I'll, let's say I'll right now Ohio State has their one linebacker committed. That's Reed Carrico. We've talked about that. They're only looking to add one more. There's three or four guys that are at the top of that list. And, yes, Ray John Davis is one of them. But the reason that people talk about it is because he has visited the school, which is a major – a plus for the Buckeyes, even though it was like a three hour visit. I was part of a bus trip with 30 other kids. He did visit the school. He is from California. It's, it shows that um, he's at least looking around. He's committed to LSU. So, you know, he's willing to leave the West coast for school. He comes from one of the best programs in the entire country at matter day high school in Santa Ana. He's a top 10 overall prospect. He's one of the best linebackers in the country. And he has been in regular contact with the Buckeyes since his visit and with Al Washington um, and, and as I wrote about on Letterman Row on Monday this week, the Buckeyes are making a very concerted push to get involved with Matter Day because it is a talent-rich school that continues to pump out player after player after player. That said, is it likely that Rajon Davis flips from LSU where he committed on New Year's Day? No, it's probably not. But you don't know. I mean, when you commit to LSU – on New Year's Day, you're committing to Dave Aranda and a team that's getting winning, ready to win a national championship and the most explosive offense in college football and all this excitement and all blah, blah, blah. His buddy and, and former teammate Elias Ricks is there and just getting enrolled. and There's all this excitement. Uh, but when they go 8-4 and four with Miles Brennan this year, it's, it changes a little. Right. I mean, things change. The dynamic changes if LSU regresses to the mean which we don't know for sure that they're going to, but it's certainly likely that uh, a complete staff of people losing all those players to the NFL, losing Joe Burrow. um, You certainly think that there's a possibility um, that LSU is a nine and four team this year, as opposed to 15 and 0. Um, So in recruiting, you have to keep, plugging away. You have to keep the conversation going. Ohio State's doing it. Rayshon Davis is receptive to it. But if he doesn't get back on campus, if he doesn't have an opportunity to continue to learn more about the Ohio State, if he doesn't, you know, the Buckeyes are presenting these linebackers like Barrett Carter and Smail Mondin and, and, and uh, Rayshon Davis this opportunity to say, we're only taking two guys. We want you to be one of them. You're the other piece. 
Uh, that's an alluring thing at a place like Ohio State. They've had more linebackers drafted in the last 20 years than any school in the country. Um, so, yeah, you take a shot. Are they a real threat? Are they a, are, is there momentum being gained? I don't, I don't know that there's momentum being gained, but as long as there's conversation being had, then you can feel like Ohio State is one of those programs that is always – a realistic option for top players like Berm. When I was, when I was a kid, I used to come through the the front door and I would, the screen door would close, but I would, the front door would always be open because I just walked through the door and didn't close it. And my dad always looked at me and said, were you born in a barn? I feel like recruiting is a little bit like that. When you walk through the door, you're actually not supposed to shut it because when you first reach out to somebody and you open that door, and they say, were you born in a barn? It's like, yeah, I'm trying to recruit this kid. I do not want to close this door because you never yeah, know. You, what you don't is. say never, but you also have to understand that a place like Ohio State, recruits are hoping that door is always open. Okay? Exactly. Like, that's, that, Ohio, I guess that's the point I'm trying to make, yeah. Right. Ohio State is a different place than at most other schools in the country, the 99% of the other college football teams in the country. They have a legitimate chance – to sign anybody like it's not a it's not a wasted effort for Ohio State to recruit any player in the country now certainly there are things that work in their favor or against them in different recruitments but there's not a wasted recruiting effort at Ohio State if if, if, go ahead there's a reason that every time somebody puts out a top eight or a top 15 no matter who they are if they've even had contact with Ohio State if they are a four or five star prospect, the likelihood of Ohio State being in that top ten or fifteen is very, very high. Right. And even if they're not having any current conversation with Ohio State, sometimes that list is put out to say, "Hey, Ohio State, I would like to talk to you." Or, um, you know, it, it's the Buckeyes are one of the elite programs in the country, one of the three or four truly elite programs, and there is nothing uh, on the recruiting trail that they feel like is a waste of time for them if they get invested. The question is, are they invested in recruiting Rajon Davis? And the answer is, I think they have decided it's worth pursuing. Even if it doesn't end up with a flip, they feel like they're, they're at least in the game because they're not a program that wastes time or money or resources um, talking to kids that they don't feel are A, a program fit, but B, a possible fit, like a possibility. So uh, I I think the answer to the question is yes, that they are involved in that conversation. But as a, as a fan, I I wouldn't recommend you getting like excited about it. Like just understand that they're, they're, they're kicking the tires and, and the, you know, maybe they could get them in the car for a test drive. So this is basically the exact same conversation we had about Elias Ricks a year ago. Well, I mean, it's a little different in that Elias Ricks had been on the records oh, telling yeah, he people did, he, did say he wanted to go to Ohio State. Right. He was on the record saying if Urban Meyer didn't retire, I would have committed to Ohio State. So there was reason to feel like you had this uh, next level shot at flipping him. But that was just unrealistic for a lot of reasons. I mean, if, you know, Cindy Crawford wanted to marry me in 1998, I would have, you know, been married to a supermodel for 25 years. Right. But like, that's who, who cares what could have happened. Like if Urban Meyer hadn't retired, but he did. So once he did retire, everything else is kind of off the table. So um, what's not off the table is Rajon Davis, but it's not like you should be expecting that he's sitting down to eat at the table yet. All right. Two more, two more quick. Ones. Two more. Let's, let's knock them out quick. All right, Berm, what's a typical day like for recruiting journalists such as yourself? Are you setting up interviews, texting recruits, et cetera? Uh, just curious as to how this process works on a daily or even weekly basis. And that is from Travis Jones. Well, right now it's different than before. Um, you know, I, I think that we're in a, in a weird time. I've spoken to a number of recruits in the last few weeks that, as Spencer and I alluded to last week uh, on this show, um, kids are getting inundated with messages and calls because coaches have nothing else to do right now. Um, and I, I think that as a analyst, as a journalist, like, I'm trying to be respectful of that. I'm actually reaching out to far fewer kids now than I would normally uh, because I don't want to 
feel like I'm burdening them with anything. And because simply put, there's not a lot of news coming out and a lot of things happening. So why stress people out who are already getting a 250, 300 text messages from coaches every day? Um, certainly trying to set up conversations and interviews for Bermanology and for talking stuff and, and to fill out notebooks and, and dotting the I's and recruiting questions of the day. But, you know, right now I'm, I'm trying to adjust to a, a world that is saying we don't have any idea what's happening. So I'm trying to be conscientious of the fact that Ohio State and other coaches around the country are at home with their kids and their families and maybe uh, aren't feeling like talking about football. Uh, you know, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, it, is, it is a lot of staying connected to the phone, though, the Internet, Twitter, text messaging, coaches, players, parents, um, and then trying to figure out ways to make sure that we're presenting to readers and to watchers and listeners, um, you know, information that's valuable and uh, timely, but also not, um, you know, being repetitive or boring. Right. I hope that That's answers all. Travis's question. Thanks, Travis. The last question is from Alex. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. It's something, you know, like uh, Shushevsky. Um, it's Coach Ken. It, it's, it's, a bunch of, it's a bunch of letters. I'm sorry, Alex. I don't want to butcher it, so I'd just rather not say it. Um, he says, in all caps, punter recruiting with the exclamation point, then says, what class do, does Ohio State take the next punter? I mean, they are telling punter recruits that it's going to be the class of 2021. Whether or not that ends up being a, No, yeah. I, mean, I, 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 wrote a, I, I wrote about a punter that they've been in contact with a few weeks ago. And um, the reality here is that what Ohio State has done at special teams in the last handful of years is probably the approach they'll take again in 2021, which is find the best in-state punter or kicker they can find put him on a plan where he's a gray shirt um, type player and then get him on the scholarship count for next year. So find the one now, get him into the program on non-scholarship and then have him uh, go on scholarship after Drew Christman is gone. Fair enough. But it should be this year. It should be this year. They did take Michael O'Shaughnessy uh, as a preferred walk on in 2020. He's a, a kid from, uh, the Columbus area, who was very good. But I think the, the, what they're telling recruits and what recruits are telling me is that they're still trying to take one in this class. You know, it's very rare that we get a special teams question. Uh, so I, I think like it. it's a good – it's a good. Uh, I want to talk more about Matt Barnes. And I, I, think, uh, I think Matt Barnes is proving to be hilarious. I don't know if you've seen some of the recent stuff on the Twitter or from the Ohio State official accounts. But Did you just say on the Twitter – yeah, it's on the line. All right, it's on the line. You 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 put your 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 internet on the line. Um, anyway, that's going to wrap up this episode of Talking Stuff. Before we get into the ridiculous, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. That's Spencer Holbrook. Thanks to the folks at Buyers Auto. If you're looking for an auto, go to buyersauto.com. Check us out next time. Follow us on Twitter. Like our stuff. Rate. Subscribe. Review. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We'll talk to you guys next time. Have a great rest of your week. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.